The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the webinar Addressing Problem Behavior, a Successful Team Pro Approach. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. To the right of the screen is the control panel. As an attendee, you will have the option to listen using your computer or phone. To switch, just select telephone in the audio pane and the follow the dial-in instructions. If you're having trouble hearing us, please send us a question and we will assist you. For today's session, we have also shared some materials located in the handouts panel. You can download these materials at any time. At the end of the presentation, we will email a certificate of attendance that you will be able to download. Since your mic is muted by default, you can submit questions to our presenter by typing them into the questions pane at any time. Please keep your questions general and not so specific to any particular individual. We will hold off answering any questions until the end of the presentation. Now, since most of you are here now, let's get started. And we will now begin the recorded portion of today's webinar. To those that have just joined us, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Addressing Problem Behavior, a Successful Team Approach. My name is Tracy Cook and I am the host for today's event. It's great to have you all here today. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Jane Barbin. Dr. Barbin is a licensed clinical psychologist board certified behavioral analyst, doctoral and licensed behavioral analyst in Virginia. She founded Behavioral Directions in 2001 and currently serves as an executive director consulting to parents, educators and public school districts while collaborating across disciplines to promote successful outcomes for those with autism, behavioral disorders and related disabilities. She previously trained in behavioral psychology at John Hopkins University School of Medicine and Kennedy Krieger Institute. She is one of the founding directors of the Ivy Mount School Autism Program, is former president of the Maryland Association for Behavioral Analysis, and is on the board of directors for the Association of Professional Behavior Analysts. Through her work, she advocates for disability awareness and provides training to parents and professional groups at the local and national level. Her interests include teaching executive functioning skills to, listen, to learners with special needs, factors related to effective school consultation, and quality indicators in autism intervention. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Barbin. Take it away. Thank you for inviting me to present this topic especially as we are now in August and back to school is around the corner. This topic is especially important for parents, educators, and other professionals as we start to think about setting students up for a, success, a successful school year. So thank you everyone for joining us. Before we start, I will elaborate a little bit on my experience as a consultant working with private and public schools for the last two decades. As a consultant retained by a large public school district for several years, I worked directly with a team of teachers and parents to create effective behavior plans for individual, stu uh, individual students with problem behaviors. And this included training teaching teams and measuring outcomes with a database system. I will continue, to, I also currently continue to work privately with individual families and partner with schools on a regular basis for the same reason. So that's a little bit more about me to give context to the presentation. So let's get started. Here's my contact information if you would like to reach me later or if you have any follow-up questions. We do frequently post information related to autism and problem behavior on our website where you can also sign up for our e-newsletter and find a link to our Facebook page. Next slide. Now for the objectives for today's presentation. I will be focusing the content on the process of behavior change within a school system. We will review reasons students might engage in problem behavior or the functional assessment process, discuss essential components of a good behavior plan, and problem solve when a plan is not working. We will also review when help from an outside professional may be needed. We will explore ways to create a collaborative, collaborative partnership between the school staff, parents, and other invested professionals throughout the process. I'll now turn off my webcam so that we can focus on the content. Next slide. I'll start with something that may sound novel to some of you and commonplace for others. 
This is an underlying and important message for today's content and all else builds on these assumptions. That behavior, including problem behavior, is learned. And that behavior can be changed. We also know that about 64% of children with autism routinely engage in at least one form of problem behavior, considering meltdown, self-injury, and aggression. And that 32% of children with autism engage in all three of these behaviors. I think this presentation is pretty timely. Next slide. We must also understand that problem behavior serves a purpose for the person. Problem behavior occurs within an environmental context. We need to think about the antecedents and the consequences when we look at behavior, and we'll dig into that today. We also know good behavior and problem behavior relate to what is being reinforced. So these are some basic assumptions that we'll go on today as we continue the presentation. Next slide. So why is this important to address today? Well, there are several reasons. First, these behaviors may be unsafe for the child and others, such as an aggression. These behaviors may interfere with skill acquisition and they can be socially stigmatizing to the person. These problem behaviors may reduce available opportunities. So we've heard parents say that their child was asked not to participate in a private speech or OT session, other interventions or social groups because of their behavior and students we have worked with have also been removed from inclusion because of their behavior. There's also social challenges with friendships. So there's also the, the idea that we must consider the underlying deficits that can translate into problem behavior if not handled correctly. Lastly, and very importantly, educators and parents can be effective change agents in addressing problem behavior in a positive way. Next slide. There are other setting events, we might call these developmental milestones that can affect the occurrence of problem behavior. So these might be normal challenges, they could be also opportunities that present at various stages. They can affect behavior such as maybe the initial transition of a child to school, going into preschool or kindergarten, transition to middle school, transition to high school, at the stage of adolescence when there's a new sibling in the home, these are all times that you may see um, a setting event, we might call them, for problem behaviors to occur. There are also other conditions that can set the stage for problem behaviors to develop. We think about autism, we think about anxiety, ADHD, learning disorders, where the content is too hard for the child and if not addressed properly, problem behaviors can result. And then there may be poor executive functioning skills where the child may get, step, get stuck, be inflexible, may not be able to initiate a task easily, cannot shift between two tasks. So how this is addressed um, by adults in the child's environment is critical for problem behavior in terms of encouraging or not encouraging it to develop. Next slide. But it takes a team to help ensure that the proper supports are in place. And if the child is qualified for special ed services, it takes a team to ensure that their special ed rights are also upheld. IDEA or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEIA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act, which aligned IDEA with No Child Left Behind in 2004, is a federal mandate for those individuals who are eligible for services. So let's quickly review the special ed process starting with eligibility. Once a child is found eligible for special ed services, and this is either through the infant and toddler program up to age three, or through child fine for school aged children, the federal mandate of IDEIA applies. Under this act, eligible children have the right to be educated in the least restrictive environment, to receive a free and appropriate education, FAPE, to have an appropriate evaluation, to have a proper IEP created, for parents to be involved in the process, and for procedural safeguards to be in place so that their rights are upheld. So in some districts, the functional behavioral assessment and behavior intervention plan components, which we will discuss today, are not actually part of the IEP. In some districts they are, in some that they're not. So when they're not, there's less protection for the child. So we need to look at other parts of the IEP to address behavioral needs. So I will work in information today um, to broaden our, um, you know, our view a bit to, to include those. Next slide. 
A functional behavioral assessment, or an FBA, begins the process of understanding why problem behaviors are occurring so that we can more effectively address them. FBA seek to answer the question, why does he or she do that? And that why helps us guide our response to the problem behavior. Again, looking at the antecedents would might occasion the behavior, what sets the stage for them to occur, and this consequence, the, the, um, the, the things that follow, those events that follow problem behavior and may keep it going. We know that the school format varies and how this is addressed. We know we need to conduct a solid assessment to identify the function. And this requires a lot more than completing a form or doing informal observations, which we often see occur in schools that we support. Next slide. We also know that interventions based on the function of the behavior are more effective, more likely to be effective, and less likely to involve aversive procedures. Behaviors can look identical, but have different functions. This is a, an important point to underscore. So by the look of what we see for that problem behavior, that does not tell us the function. Aggression can occur for multiple reasons, and so that's what we're gonna to discuss today. Our goal is to replace the function of the problem behavior with new skills, communication skills for the child, tolerance skills for not having a preferred item that they might want. So then we get to who might request this FBA. So um, school staff, such as a special ed teacher or, or an administrator can request it, but also know that parents can request it as well. And the parents would request it, of course, if they have problems uh, or concerns with any of the, the child's behavior. And this should be documented under the present level of performance section of the IEP. I think that is an appropriate place for that to go so that we, we start documenting our process. But know that an FBA can also be done outside of the school process by a professional credentialed in the field of behavior analysis or a board certified behavior analyst. Next slide. Let's look at understanding the context of the environment as we look to address behavior in the child. For me as a clinician who consults often in schools, I know we need to start with understanding the school environment itself. If we don't consider the variables at work within the environmental context, we are not as likely to be effective. What is the, what is the philosophy, philosophy across a multidisciplinary team? We need to be considering that so that we can develop rapport with the team and come together and create shared goals so that we can address them together. We must commit as a team to evidence-based practice to address problem behavior, and that will focus on applied behavior analysis. Next slide. Speaking of behavior, what does problem behavior look like? The range is wide as you can imagine and very individual. So here are just a few. Disruption, might be calling out in class, might be throwing items, task refusal, maybe not initiating a task when asked, getting out of the seat uh, as, you know, in the classroom. Tantrum might, tantrums might include whining, yelling, getting under the desk, Aggression can include pushing or hitting peers, biting, a multitude of other things. And self-injurious behaviors might include self-hitting or headbanging. And then in autism, often we see repetitive behaviors, such as repetitive movements, um, repeated words. So to start, we must clearly operationally define the problem behavior with an agreed upon definition. For example, what would constitute task refusal? Would it be task refusal if a second prompt is given for the child to start the task? How about a third prompt? What about the time lapse in between the prompts? We need everyone to agree on the operational definition of the problem behavior before we start. Next slide. And why did these behaviors occur? Here are possible options, and this, is, this part is very important. We're going to focus on this today. Again, by looking at the behavior, we don't know the function. We need to explore and identify the function. Sometimes behaviors occur to escape or avoid a demand. Sometimes behaviors occur to gain attention from peers, adults, or to access a preferred item or activity of the child's choice. And sometimes problem behaviors occur for internal or sensory purposes. So the behavior might be self-reinforcing in that case, and those are a little bit more challenging to address. 
Keep in mind that there are usually nuances we must find and consider if our evaluation is to be effective. Also, many problem behaviors occur for multiple reasons or functions, and this makes it even more complicated. Next slide. But the key is to understand the reason. Why is the behavior, what is the behavior communicating? Then we're on a better path to identifying the most effective way to respond. Next. We need educators to have proper professional development, in-service training and technical oversight and support for a proper FBA to occur. IDEA mandates FBAs in certain situations but we have few guidelines to follow that have been given to schools. And schools are often without agreed upon methods within the counties and across counties. So we should avoid teacher-generated non-norm measures. I will share some normed measures today with some caveats. We also know that educational teams get minimal training in this area. I think we can agree on that. I think often teachers are looking for more training in my experience. We also know that data collection is usually by the special education teacher and it could entail the teacher's impressions without collecting, collecting any additional data. Finally, we know the ABA field can help and it provides a solid methodology as the standard in our field and I will share that today. Next. Functional assessment are the term more often used by schools, functional behavioral assessment is a set of procedures used to identify the reason the behavior is occurring. And it usually involves a combination of a few things. Indirect assessment, where there's no direct observation, might involve rating scales um, filled out by adults that know the child, or an interview with, with important adults in the child's life. Two rating scales I can list here would be the FAST, the Functional Analysis Screening Tool, and the QABF, the Questions About Behavioral Function. Again, these are these do not involve direct observations of the child. Then we have descriptive assessments where we are observing the behavior in the context. The structured antecedent behavior con uh, consequence analysis is one such example where you're observing and you're completing a form. A finally functional analysis, which is observing and measuring problem behavior in at least two contexts derived from an interview and testing if the behavior occurs in one context and not another. For example, this requires some advanced training in ABA. So some of these resources and materials or tools, including a caregiver interview, are, including, are included in the handouts provided in this seminar today. Note that we should do a caregiver interview and direct observation of the behavior, though we may include other measures. So in general rating scales, have in general, our rating skills, even the ones I'm proposing today, have not always been found to have adequate reliability and validity to predict the true function of problem behavior. So we need to dig deeper. And that's where a functional analysis, again, requiring some advanced skills, can come in handy. Next. Here's the FAST, which is an indirect measure, as mentioned. In this measure, a rating form should be completed for each problem behavior of concern. So not combining, not combining problem behaviors because there may be different functions of, of, these, of each behavior. Also, multiple adults can complete the form on one behavior. So the form gets scored at the bottom and shows some possible functions that were identified and it can help us get on our way. So if we're using an indirect measure, which could be better over a school created or non-normed form, we wanna be sure to combine with other methods. So do have, when you're looking at this form here, do have the teacher complete the open in section to the left. I find I often get a lot of insight from the teacher's input there in terms of what settings does the, the behavior occur. And that's a, a mini interview that can help us if we're going to do a functional analysis. Here's another tool, and this is from Brian Iwata and team. This is the structured ABC analysis, which is completed while actively observing. Often we see schools use general ABC forms, which can also be less accurate. So in this case, um, if a general ABC form is used and not a, like a, a structured, like pre-printed one, the adult's recording will then depend on variables the parent or teacher feels to be important. So we might miss something or not be aware of a variable that is really impacting the behavior. So again, these two forms that I just shared are included in the handouts for today's topic. 
next. Again, we are looking at antecedents when we're doing a functional assessment. What's occurring before, such as a skill deficit in communication, maybe the child's difficulty maintaining attention to a task, and that can establish escape as more reinforcing. So it gives us ideas of things that might happen before. We need to look at that part of the equation. And then consequences, what's happening after? Is the child getting someone's attention or break through problem behavior? And that can keep that, that problem behavior going. It's something we need to think about, the before, the after. Next. In a functional analysis, we directly manipulate and observe environmental events to test our hypothesis. In a standard functional analysis, we're going to rapid, rapidly alternate four conditions in a multi-element design. These conditions would be testing for attention, escape, alone, and then we would use a play condition as a control to evaluate the function. In a brief func functional analysis, this is a variation of using shorter sessions of the above example. In a precursor analysis, a variation of the functional analysis as well, this can be safer because what we're doing here is assessing specific behaviors which precede the more dangerous behavior. Because maybe testing the dangerous behavior, again, could be dangerous. So you might notice that the child yells before they hit. So we may decide to do a functional analysis focused on yelling and get a good idea of the function for hitting as well. And then there's an interview-informed synthesized contingency analysis, or the ISCA, which can also be brief and begins with an interview and an observation, and it's about a 30-minute period of test conditions that follows. This slide may sound a bit technical, and it is, but it's important for parents and educators to know that the process should be based on evidence-based practices. A BCBA needs to be involved for this higher level assessment noted on this slide. And also look for a BCBA if there's any safety concern. Get them on your team through a school resource that's available or by privately retaining one, given that this functional analysis uh, component requires very specific skills. I do have some additional uh, reference materials in the handouts on this as well. Next. So after understanding the function, we will be more uh, likely to move to creating a, an effective behavior plan for the child. In some situations, the results of the FBA may be to identify if a behavior plan is needed at all, based on how the school sets up the process. I find that unusual, but that seems to happen where we go through an FBA to determine if we're going to move to a VIP at all. And I would wonder why would we be conducting an FBA on a behavior that we're not concerned about in the first place? but it may be more about disagreement on how the behavior is viewed by the team as a whole. However, components to consider when you plan for a behavior intervention plan would include gaining informed consent from guardians, identifying if the plan is acceptable to both parents and implementers, and outlining how training and monitoring will occur. Next. Other necessary components of a behavior intervention plan that deserve to be understood include operational definitions, which we touched on before. It's what constitutes the behavior for consistency across adults, that we're scoring the same thing. We're looking at and noting what we're trying to address, what we're trying to decrease in this case. What does it look like? What does it sound like? And as we go along, inevitably, I find um, even in our in our in-office ABA clinic, we're modifying operational definitions. We're determining if those definitions need to be revised based on a different behavior that we're seeing or something we're not exactly capturing, but we do need to be working on off of operational definitions. We need to plan to teach functionally equivalent replacement behaviors. For example, waiting or requesting, raising, a, raising for the child to raise their hand. Now, then again, these have to match the function or the reason the behavior is occurring. And we need to reinforce good behavior quickly and often. Another essential component that must be in a behavior plan is how should adults respond to the problem behavior? Let's define the adult's response when the behavior occurs so that we can be consistent on the plan. And finally, outcome measurement is a necessary component. We need objective data to determine that the plan is or is not working. It's often best practice to teach two replacement behaviors for every problem behavior. And it's also good practice to include 
prescriptive language for the child, what they should do, versus proscriptive language, what they should not do. An example could be on behavior during transitions in the hallway in a school. We might direct the child to have your hands on your hips in the hallway versus no pushing. And this would be a little bit more descriptive as what to do versus what not to do. Next. Fitting with the IEP format, we can both modify the antecedents, and this ties in uh, with some later slides. We can modify the antecedent to accommodate the behavior or the deficit, so the challenge is reduced. We can change the environment, change the task, or on the other side of the equation, we can remediate the deficit, which helps the child learn to face and manage the challenge. And here on both sides, we need to be thinking. When we look at a behavior plan, we need to be thinking about how are we accommodating the child, the child's needs, the child's deficits, how are we remediating the deficit so that they can manage and then you know, have the skills to, to meet that function otherwise. Next. And we need to be thinking of the skills we need to teach a child with problem behavior. I'll mention a few of these. I think this list is so powerful. Teaching the child to communicate based on the function of the behavior. If they're trying to escape, teaching a way to ask for a break. Teaching the child to tolerate when reinforcers are not available, when they're ended, when they're not coming, when they're delayed. Teaching play and leisure skills to compete with internal or sensory functions that we might find. So if the child can develop better play and leisure skills, we may see some of those internally motivated behaviors drop, such as self-talking or pacing and those types of things. Teaching appropriate ways for the child to gain the attention of others. Teaching compliance with usual directions. Teaching the child to escape or avoid situations that are unpleasant to them in an appropriate way by asking, I need a break, help me please. Teaching them how to gain access to and keep their preferred items. And we need to extend those skills as they occur um, to relevant people in context in the, in the child's environment. So a really powerful list will be good to go back to later when you're, you're writing a behavior intervention plan. Next. Interventions, which are antecedent based, and this is the accommodate side, can involve many things. So here's some other ideas. In the next couple slides I'm giving ideas, and of course we're going to want to tailor to the child. We might give the child a choice. We might reduce demands in the child's environment through teaching them to request help or a break or easier work. We may visually structure rules and expectations. What do you do? What do we need you to do? What is ex expected here in morning work? Have that outlined. So a visual daily schedule can help as well. Providing more attention or breaks to the child. Sometimes we schedule attention or we schedule breaks so that the child is getting enough of those and has no longer the need or desire, let's say the desire to engage in that problem behavior for that reason. And we might reduce noise or verbal prompting in the area, which might be overloading to the child or overwhelming. And sometimes in, in our field, we talk about enriched environment. We might enrich the child's environment by adding more preferred items, um, a preferred location, um, ways to, to, add, to, to gain access to more preferred things for good behavior, um, or just in general that the environment is more enriched so that the child is less likely to engage in problem behavior. So this again is that accommodate side, the before behavior happens uh, focus. Next. And so we would seek first to prevent the problem behavior as we've been discussing. Next. And we would seek, seek to teach alternative skills. So if the behavior is grabbing from others, we would teach the child to share. If the behavior is calling out, we might teach the child to raise their hand. If we see hitting, we might teach the child to use words to communicate, find a way to compromise instead by using maybe a process. And if the child is out of their seat, we may teach the child to ask for help or reinforce in seat behavior. And then again here, I don't want to, to confuse the process of we, we don't want to assume what the function is. These could be likely matches if the function, you know, relates to that, that they're grabbing um, to gain an item, then offering to share would meet that function. Behavior to increase when we're trying to reduce something else. We're looking at what we want to replace, some alternative skills. Next. For other interventions, differential reinforcement means that you select and reinforce some behaviors and not others, 
or you might reinforce alternative or incompatible behaviors instead. We must specify what those are, though. So visual supports like posted rules, materials, token boards, point charts, help to teach expectations to the child as well. So those are some other intervention ideas. Next. Other interventions might involve extinction, and this would include discontinuing reinforcement for what was previously reinforced in terms of behavior, but we need to understand that we have or be able to have good control over the reinforcement if, if we're going to go that direction. It can mean ignoring the behavior if the behavior was designed to, if the child is seeking attention with it, then extinction would mean ignoring the behavior. It might mean interrupting the behavior or it could mean working through the behavior if we, again, depending on function, find that the behavior is to escape a task. We might decide we're working through the task. So extinction would be defined by the function of the behavior. And, you know, we may see an extinction burst, and that's nothing, uh, not something we would take lightly. So we want to make sure that it would be safe to do. Uh, you take an extinction approach before we start because it may not always be an essential piece to the plan. Next slide. On this slide, I'll go through more function-based intervention ideas. Again, it needs to be tailored to the student or your child. And um, these are just ideas, but it breaks it down by function to underscore that that's the approach we must take. That again, would be more likely to evolve, involve less aversive procedures and to be more effective. So when we think about behaviors that are designed um, that the child is using to escape or avoid or delay, we may think of these things. We might make the task easier. We may teach the child to request a break. We might schedule breaks for the child. We might break down the task. We might use what we call three-step guided compliance or a systematic prompting process to follow through. Then we might reinforce cooperation. In smaller parts, we're going to shape the behavior. And we might also have the teacher assist. If the child's trying to escape and the teacher comes over to assist, that drives down that, that need or that, again, I should say, function to, to escape. Let's go to attention and tangible functions. I combine those because those are both um, socially mediated reinforcers too. Um, but here we're possibly teaching the child to request attention, request the item. You might just give the attention or the item to the child on a schedule. Again, driving down that, that function. We might reinforce the absence of the behavior. So when it's not occurring, to gain attention, we're going to reinforce it. We might cue peers to ignore. Often we see uh, other kids laughing in class or um, giving, giving that student a reaction, and that's what re is reinforcing. So as much as we may seek to change the adult's behaviors, when peers are still reinforcing, it's something we need to consider. We may allow the child to earn the item when tokens or points are earned. So for the internal function, receiving the, it's a self-reinforcing behavior, let's say. We might provide, provide an alternative competing stimulation. We might block the behavior like hand flapping if it's for internal reasons. We may reinforce the non-occurrence of the behavior. We may allow access at certain times like to teach discrimination. And often when we look at the internal function, we usually need to use a combination of these. That's what our research literature is telling us. Next slide. Forehand and Long had additional ideas for creating a positive environment for a child with problem behaviors. Some things they suggest are to have structure and routines, always good. Communicating with the full team for consistency. We all need to be on the same page with how we address the student. We don't want the divide and conquer approach. It's gonna just therefore reinforce the behavior even further. We need to get a homeschool communication plan. How will we communicate? When, on what? How are we going to convey this information back and forth? We need to request feedback from the child and take turns talking, which means we're listening with a child that, that's vocal, where we can understand what's happening and, and really try to, to plan an effective approach. We need to build the child's self-esteem by highlighting their strengths. And we need to help the child solve problems with their peers, especially meaningful when we think about children with autism. Next slide, please. We've covered a lot here, and we also know this process can be difficult. We work with lots of early career teachers trying to get on top of this process. 
staff training and experience in the area of problem behavior varies widely. I've seen that personally and professionally, and I think that's experience across the board when I when I speak with my colleagues around around the country. We suggest teachers always seek out resources and supports. Sometimes classroom management strategies are needed. Sometimes a student-specific system is needed. When you have a resource room or a self-contained classroom, putting specific procedures into place as a system can set that classroom up for success. So hopefully a little humor kind of gets us through this hard time of, you know, people trying to figure out this process and some of the technicalities that I've reviewed today. Next slide. Let's move to another essential component of an effective behavior plan, and that is measuring outcome. This is not optional, but it is, it needs to be fit to the setting. It needs to be fit to the student. It's not just a blanket, you know, form that you would use. It must be tailored. Data must be objective. It cannot be a, a subjective approach. This is what I think. This is what I believe happened. I believe things were better last week. We must have data. We must be objective. We can collect data, we should collect data for um, behaviors targeted for both increase and decrease. So there's replacement behaviors, let's track those. Aggression, self-injury, tantrums, let's track those. We wanna see some decrease, we wanna see others increase and we need to be tracking both. We can track by rate or frequency of behavior occurrence. We can track by duration, the behavior lasted, how long a non-compliance um, task refusal episode lasted. We can track by intensity. If we have a scale that's objective enough, you know, was that high intensity self-injury, a moderate, um, sometimes we'll define high or moderate intensity self-injury by redness on the skin or the sound of, um, you know, how hard, like the distance of the slapping, um, if there was any visible damage or tissue damage to the, to the, the area on the child's body. Um, latency is another measure we will use. For latency, we're talking about how soon after a signal does the behavior occur. And often we use percentage of intervals, like yes, no, every 30 minutes. Did it occur, did it not? It's still objective. It's a bit easier for teachers. And we're really going for high integrity data, not 24 hours of data, not data the entire time the child's in the school system, although sometimes that can be helpful and needed. Um, we just want accurate data that we can use adequately to determine if our plan is working, if the behavior is changing. And of course, we can also look at the percentage of opportunities in which those behaviors occur. So when there was an opportunity to ask for a break or there was an opportunity to engage in problem behavior because a signal occurred, like a task was presented, for example, did that occur? Did that behavior occur? So we need to obviously collect that accurate objective data. Um, so often I see frequency data collected and sometimes graphed by school teams, just straight out, just on the y-axis frequency data, number of times it occurred. And while those graphs may look impressive and um, to the naked eye, you know, that seems like maybe that's an appropriate approach, that is really often inaccurate. When a child leaves school early or goes home sick or you're only observing for part of the time, so you're observing therefore for varying amounts of time for each data point, so our data points do not equate. So we need to be looking at like rate per hour or percentage of intervals or an ob objective way to analyze behavior so that we base our decisions on if the intervention is working on accurate data. Next slide. I would suggest that data from a behavior plan be reviewed at least quarterly, if not sooner. And I believe it needs to be, it should be reviewed quarterly. And FBAs may need to be reviewed annually, if not sooner, and they need to be updated. The function may change. Maybe we didn't identify the right function in the first place if the behavior plan is not changing. So we can ask um, if the child's short-term goals are being met, and if not, revise them or determine why. Maybe there's a medication change that was in process and we need to give it more time in terms of the, the written behavior, behavior intervention plan. Um, we need clearly documented changes on the plan, on the child's IEP, on the child's behavior intervention plan, we need to document what changes we are making so we have a written record and everyone's on the same page. We also need extra attention to transitions. So for example, if the child's changing school, say middle school to, to high school, um, say they're just changing schools for other reasons, maybe staff are changing and we've had an excellent general education teacher. In that case, I will always ask for the team to document on the present level of performance what has worked, 
what written, let's get in writing the, the, the specifics on what did work. Maybe it was firm boundaries from the general education teacher, or maybe it was um, the proximity of the staff to the child or certain ways that we prompted them. We need to document things that have worked in the past, especially when transitions are coming up so we do not lose that information and have to start over. We might also want to document coping skills that were helpful to the child, or again, how to cue the child to, to best practice them in the future. Next slide. So where does the IEP come in? I promised that I would tie that in, and I need to tie that in, especially when behavior intervention plans and FBAs are not part of the IEP process, not part of that actual legal document. We should work as a team to create a compre comprehensive IEP document regardless um, once a child has been found eligible for services. Problem behavior can and should be referenced directly or indirectly in several places in an IEP. Here are various avenues within an IEP in which behavior can be addressed before or after it has become significant. In the present level of performance, we can, rec we can record the frequency, duration, intensity, et cetera, of behaviors of concern um, and the areas of need that impact these behaviors, like the child has a difficult time asking for a break or asking for help, or the child is not a vocal communicator, for example. We can also document social skills deficits, and those are things that, that we need to keep, keep in mind. Under the parent input, there is a section in an IEP where the parents provide input. When I serve as an advocate in an advocacy role, um, directly working with parents, I will always ask parents to prepare that statement in advance so that they can have it ready. Here we want to list the child's support needs. What has or has not been effective? How does your child's disability impact their general education inclusion? For example, are their behavior in general, right? So under the parent in input section, that's a, part, that's a part of the IEP where we can get that information down. Goals and objectives are a major component of an IEP. Here is where we also want to look at behavior, not just in a section called problem behavior and having goals on reducing something or, or increasing. And this is a good section to have too, but think about in communication, you're going to want to have goals that tie into ways that you can reduce problem behavior under academic sections, under social goals, all of those areas in addition to a behavior section um, can include goals that are relevant for reducing problem behavior, just addressing it in general with replacement skills. And then we have that accommodations page, right? That necessary accommodations. What are necessary things the child needs for them to be successful? So when it comes to problem behavior, some examples might be frequent breaks, a positive reinforcement system, a visual schedule to get those expectations out, extended time to respond, preferential seating, and we should define that. Is that next to an appropriate peer that might be a model? Is that in front of the classroom? Is that in the back of the classroom because they need to stand up and walk around? Preferential seating is one example. Reduce distractions in the child's environment. Write in there that the child has a behavior intervention plan because you can write in other examples that are not pre-written pre and pre-checked. Nonverbal prompting. Maybe this is an area that's been found to, to be helpful for the child. Those are a list of places that, that should be considered. Next. So given all the information I have shared today, we know staff still find this process difficult to do, and it is. It is a difficult thing to do. Staff may feel that they have insufficient training and support, and I validate that. That is often the case. Schools work within limited resources sometimes. Staff may feel encumbered by other team members, so they're not getting support. They want to do a certain thing, but they feel like they're limited in doing that certain thing. Staff may feel challenged to confront the child and be the bad guy. They might feel it sets a bad example to accommodate one particular student, or that it takes too much time and resources for that one child, and we have other children to address. They may, have, may feel concerned with disruption to their classroom environment and just want to appease the child and not really address the problem behavior effectively. And there might be a lack of administrative support, to be frank. Sometimes that is the case. We also hear things like, if I offer incentives or resources, is it fair to other students who are already being good? Or we've heard, if I ignore the behavior, will it look like it's okay for other students to do it? 
and these are real life feelings. I validate that too. I've also heard a fairly new general education teacher tell me, and she had a great understanding of individual students' needs. And again, she was a general ed teacher that's fairly new in her career. She referred to it as, everyone gets what they need. And she was always willing to try new strategies that I gave her to keep that one child with autism in her classroom, in that general education classroom. I was so impressed with her. And she found ways to get around that. But I know each school is different and each you know, administrator um, has a different um, you know, way they want the school to operate. So these are areas to think about because we need to problem solve these to figure out why are we not getting to that best practice approach. Next slide. When things are not working. So continuing here, here are some ideas to consider. You might decide to schedule an IEP meeting. Either the parents or the school, the school team could initiate that. They might schedule a VIP meeting as well. One place to, to go would be to collect fidelity data on the plan. How well is the plan being implemented? So we might divvy up or you know up, um, create a component analysis of that behavior plan and check to see how well the components are implemented. So we're looking at the adult behavior in this case. Outside professionals may need to help with, with creating such a form and, and doing that well, but that's a technique that we often use when we go in to observe to see how well the behavior plan is actually being implemented. Now then we can look at the data to see if the child's responding once we know the plan's actually being used as intended. We also want to consider ways to maximize generalization and maintenance of the plan. We want to evaluate if database decision making is in place. And as I mentioned before, are the data accurate? Are they accurate? Is what we're collecting accurate? And we want to return to, we could return to the FBA process itself and involve a more highly trained uh, staff person or BCBA or just the whole team may need to redo the FBA if we're not finding effectiveness. We might have identified the wrong function. So there are several avenues and procedural safeguards, including other things like filing a complaint mediation and due process that are all part of those procedural safeguards available to students eligible for special education services. And there may be a special education advisory committee in place in your county, um, and teachers and parents are encouraged to stay involved in those, and, and that's a great avenue too for behavior change across the system. I want to give another website that's actually not in your handouts, and it's called rightslaw.com, W-R-I-G-H-T-S, law, all one word, Rights Law, W-R-I-G-H-T-S-L-A-W.com is also a very helpful website that goes through legal proceedings and processes that may be helpful in, in understanding a child's special ed rights. Next slide. When things are not working, suspension and expulsion may occur. And this is a hot topic right now. I'm sure many of you have heard of this. Um, if a parent is asked to pick up their child related to their child's problem behavior, they should make sure to get that request in writing from the school. They should also know that after 10 total days of suspension, this is not consecutive days, but 10 total days, and they can be partial days, a manifestation hearing or meeting should occur to determine if that behavior is a result of the child's disability. It's called a manifestation hearing, as mentioned. So if so, other avenues such as creating an FBA or BIP or revising those in, that are in place need to be explored. And that's a, a very important safeguard parents should be aware of. Parents must understand also, in addition to the safeguards, um, that the team should, should work together to keep open communication and collaboration in order for our whole process to be effective. So sometimes we're rebuilding communication and collaboration when that is broken down. Next slide. It may also be helpful to better understand the purpose that schools exist. So what are the goals of the school system? Schools exist to enhance educational outcome of students. Clinical practice may be the focus, though evidence-based practice is mandated by IDEA. So again, let me rephrase that. Clinical practice may not be the focus in a school, but evidence-based practice certainly is. And schools operate within designated and limited resources. We need to acknowledge that. I think we know that, but I think we need to acknowledge that when we're going through this process. But behavioral consultants, advocates, and medical professionals can also bridge the gap between educational and clinical practice. So if involved, a private behavioral consultant's role could be to help bridge that gap, as mentioned, and to transfer skills developed in other settings, such as the home or the community, back to the community setting. 
Next slide. So clearly a partnership between schools and outside professionals is important, especially when the child is being serviced in the home as well. A couple months ago, I conducted research for another presentation by surveying school administrators on their experience with behavioral consultants and BCBAs. This was fascinating research, and I got a really nice response, uh, candid responses from many of the administrators in our local area. Um, I know we have some administrators and some behavior consultants joining us today, so this seems especially pertinent. pertinent. I found that school administrators perceived that behavior consultants often discounted teachers' input in meetings and did not always understand the role of the school. And that was a comment made by several of the administrators. On the other hand, schools also found behavior consultants or BCBAs most helpful in defining and giving ideas for problem behavior, the content of our, of our talk today. They found that these behavior consultants were most helpful in that area. They also found them helpful in providing an interface between home and school and suggesting a process for monitoring data. And that's great because that's a skill set we certainly have as BCBAs. Another administrator noted they have, meaning BCBAs, have a, spe a specific set of valuable skills that can be helpful if not forced upon the team. And I left that in there for emphasis because I thought that was important in terms of being collaborative. And another administrator noted, Showing respect for visitor policies and staff schedules for observations will go a long way towards helping our school prioritize you as an outside consultant. And I thought that was really well put, really well put, and some information that we need to consider as well. Next slide. Let's look again at when outside consultation may be needed. So we're gonna wrap up here with, with looking at this needed area. Sometimes there may be safety issues that come up where you do need additional consultation, either as a higher level resource within the school or as an outside professional. They add, they add expertise, they can add additional expertise. They give an objective opinion a lot of the time and they can fill a knowledge gap that might be occurring on the team might want to involve when, them when more in-depth evaluation and treatment is needed, such as when the behavior is unsafe. They can be helpful when observing across settings, especially if there's the home tie-in and that consultant also is working in the home with the child. We need that tie-in. They can be helpful for initial and, and ongoing training for high fidelity behavior implementation. They can be helpful for problem solving on time constraints and when there's internal re, uh, resources that are limited to help to figure out how to manage that. They can be helpful when they bring together parties, again, as a change agent to commit to an outside plan. And with monitoring, again, going back to helping establish data collection uh, processes and having a plan for adjustments. So that said, I would wrap up today's content by going to any questions that, that the uh, attendees may have for us. Thank you, Dr. Babin, for today's session. And that concludes the presentation portion. And we'll begin the Q&A session of today's webinar. We will now begin answering questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions to the questions pane in your control panel. Dr. Babin, our first question, what what should you do when our son has BIP and after one year continues with the same behavior? That happens often, unfortunately. Um, I would reiterate a few of the points that I made in the presentation. Um, one, I would say go back to the function, maybe go back to that FBA and determine if you have the right function. Because we know FBAs conducted in schools often involve um, informal observations and teacher impressions, to be frank, um, and we know that they are working on limited resources, it may be time to step it up and go to a functional analysis and get a BCBA involved if one is not involved uh, up to this point. And the other part that would be important to talk about is the data collection process. So are we sure that we're collecting objective data and that the data are accurate so that we know that the plan is or is not working? Sometimes we see incremental gains and that's okay if that is a, you know, a, a gain that, that is meaningful for the child's life. So looking at both of those pieces I think is really critical at this time. 
Thank you, Dr. Bourbon. Our next question, what are some unique ways that you move that you move from most restrictive prompting to the least restrictive prompting? Okay, so this can be in the context of problem behavior or in skills training. And so since we talked a lot about problem behavior, maybe we can talk about skills training. Um, when we're using most prompting, or you might call it most restrictive, it sounded like, we might call it most prompting to least prompting, then in that case, we might, we might refer to that as errorless teaching. So when we're giving enough prompts and the child doesn't really have a chance to, to, to fail, and we don't want them to fail, and then we would gradually reduce it. But I think the question has to do is, how would you reduce it? Um, there are some approaches where if the child is successful for, say, two consecutive opportunities at the certain, like the current prompt level, then you might move down to the next prompt level. So that you're actually using data to guide your prompting sequence. And that might be a way to start if, the, if you're trying to look for, you know, an evidence-based way to do that. Good question. Thank you. Our next question, are these forms used by all adult instructors, such as an inquine specialist in mental health and learning? Can you repeat that, such yeah. as? Um, an equine specialist in mental health and learning. Um, so I'm assuming we're talking about the the, the FAST and, and the structured ABC form. And are we talking, does it sound like we're talking about assessing behavior non-human behavior? Is that, can we maybe get a clarification sure, on that actually. question? Uh, Wanda, if you want to just respond to that, why don't we move on to the next question and we'll let her respond. Our next question, how do you analog FAs fall? Oh, sorry, where do analog, analog FAs fall? I didn't use the word analog today, but I certainly referenced analog functional analysis. Um, so when I talked about functional analysis, I was talking about analog functional analysis. And here, um, that's where I went through the, like a, um, the standard functional analysis, the precursor functional analysis, and the ISCA. And those are all forms where we might look at an analog situation and, and try to get information as to the function of the behavior. So it is a higher level assessment. So that is what I was referring to on that slide that talked about functional analysis. Thank you, and I'm just waiting for a clarification, so I'll move on to our next question. Do you have any recommendations specifically for biting? Um, of course you're gonna start with the function. And by looking at the behavior, you know, knowing that the child approaches the adult and bites and we might have an operational definition with that, that tells us nothing of the function. So we need to look at what's happening before and what's happening after and go through our functional assessment process. Biting can occur to gain attention, right? Certainly when you're being bitten, often that can be, you know, attention maintained because you're gonna get that attention from the child, you know, get that attention because the behavior, it, hurt, it hurts. So one thing to think about is, is it indeed attention? And it may not be attention. Is the child biting to get out of a task? No, you don't have to do it. Is there another thing? No, you look, look like you're overwhelmed. Let me give you this toy to play with. You know, and then you can take a break. It looks like you need a break. And so that behavior communicated. So it will be repeated in that case, perhaps. So to address biting, you would do the same thing, the same, the same, you know, use the same strategies that I reviewed today. I'm gonna go back to the functional assessment process and move up the chain. If you can start with a functional analysis, that's ideal. That's obviously ideal. If you have a private consultant that's working with you that has skills in this area, sometimes I find that we can identify the function and start a treatment plan in the home, and then we have a little bit more um, under our belt to approach the school with and say, we're doing this plan. It's been effective. We have some data on it. We've actually made it a little bit easier because we've been able to make some gains along the way, and now the child has this skill that they can use instead, and we'd like to introduce this into the child's behavior plan at school or to ask for an FBA to be conducted to start the chain of events. So in terms of biting, that's how I would answer that. It's a good question too. Thank you, Dr. Bobbin. Uh, we do have a clear, uh, an update from Wanda on that question. So uh, she asks, we work with children on the spectrum by partnering a trained horse and student with special needs for self-empowerment and behavioral changes. Will your forms you have shown work in this case? 
Absolutely. If you're looking at the child's problem behavior, you're regardless what what you know, if you're doing training of any format, you know, any format. Remember, we talked about behaviors learned, behavior can be changed across the board, right? Human, non-human. Sounds like the question is is really geared towards a child partnering with a horse a horse and trying to change behavior. Absolutely. Now the version I shared was a classroom version since we're talking about you know, a school setting um, for most of our content today. But there are a couple other versions and you can feel free to email me that I can share those where you're looking at different antecedents because um, to your point, Wanda, I think you, you make a good one. The form that I've shared, the structured ABC, really talks about things that might occur before a behavior in a school setting. Um, you know, transitions in a hallway or something like that. And then the consequences are geared towards things that that a teacher might do, for example, or things that might occur in a school setting. So there is a home version um, of that. I mean, actually, I was trying to find like more the standard version that was um, the one that has been normed. But if you want to contact me, I can try to send you, you know, some other adaptations so that maybe it's fit to your setting a little bit more. What I appreciate about the question, especially with the structured ABC, is that you're also trying to move beyond just write down whatever occurs before, write down whatever happens after. You may start with that to get ideas, but then we want to have everybody try to report on some some categories that might be typically occurring in your, um, let's say, the, the, the therapy setting that you're working within. And I know that that's valuable as well. So thank you for that really good question. Thank you, Dr. Ben. Byron. I think we have time for one more question. Um, just. Excellent. Do you have any resources, helpful resources you could share, websites, books, et cetera, to teach us more about replacement behaviors? Yes. Um, there, I can think of some more. Maybe I can um, have those shared through OR, and, and maybe I can do that later. I can try to think of some other, you know, some additional things. Really, when we're thinking about replacement behaviors, we're thinking about what replaces the function. So you know you already have narrowed things down. If you know the function's attention, you're already going to be trying to match that function with an alternative replacement. So you would immediately think about how can the child request? How can we give them, give them attention without them needing to ask if asking is hard? Because you have to go to a device and there's multiple screens. You know, sometimes we find that doesn't really help because it's not efficient and it's too effortful for the child. So we need something that's going to be efficient and, you know, that we call it the behavioral economic side. It's going to replace the behavior quickly in a lower effort way. So think of it that way when you're trying to generate ideas for replacement behaviors. But I love that you're thinking of them because behavior plans that are good do entail teaching replacements. We need to always be building up skills so that we can be combating problem behaviors. Thank you. And by looking at the time, that is all the time we have for today. So again, thank you, Dr. Barbin, for your excellent presentation. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. Once we close out of this event, you will receive an exit survey. We would appreciate it if you can complete that and provide your feedback. Everyone will receive a follow-up email with a link to today's video recording and materials within the next week. And on behalf of the Organization for Autism Research and Dr. Jane Barbin, thanks for joining us this afternoon and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.